I'm very excited to to uh, talk to you both about two things. We're here to talk also about uh, the Making Vinyl Conference that we just missed by just a few weeks. And also, we're here to talk a little bit about Record Store Day, which uh, Larry's written a book about. So um, I guess the place to start is, I'm sorry I didn't attend uh, this conference. I was, uh, I was teasing with my wife about it. I really wanted to go and uh, visit Minneapolis. And uh, Michael Fremer, in fact, uh, told me, uh, he said, uh, it was the best one yet so i missed a good one so what what are some of your thoughts about the uh, conference that just passed it, it probably was one of our best ones yet um it was our rebound after covid um event also because um when we came back um and did our first event in 2022 we went to nashville and we weren't really sure how many people would attend and we were still even in the planning stages under the restrictions of covid um so we, we thought we would get maybe 30 40 people that would attend that particular event and that event quickly grew to 200 people and we thought oh god we got to find a much bigger space and um <clears throat> coming you know to minneapolis again we weren't really sure as far as how many people were going to attend and right you know the the number was magical you know, we had a lot of great people that uh came together there was tons of networking that took place um couldn't really get people into the conference room because so many people were in the foyer in our our show, showcase area just chatting, networking, really having a great time, um, and really kind of, you know, talking through their issues. Um, and the event was just the icing on the cake for, for those type of people. You know, also, the, the industry is in a very peculiar spot. Um, last year, when we were in Nashville, at that point, we were still hearing reports of delays, the bottleneck. Right. But we knew that there was a buildup of not only you know brand new small plants, but also uh, the existing plants were rapidly expanding, like doubling in size of their capacity. Um, and this year, it was basically the catch up, the reality of the implications of all that. You know, where, where's all the business going to come from now that we we we, we got it down to two months? wait time from the time that the order gets in you know what let's just step back for one second let's explain to people who maybe maybe we're a little uh, we're ahead of the curve here a little bit Tr can you guys just sort of for our listeners for our audience just sort of explain we're talking about the making vinyl conference i'll i'll uh pad a little introduction before this thing rolls in in real time but uh why don't you what's your elevator pitch we know that the conference is about uh records we know it's about vinyl we know it's about making vinyl but if we really don't know the the nuts and bolts how do you sort of explain this to somebody on the street who says yeah i like records i got a record collection you guys go hey i'm we're we're involved in this conference how do you explain it to someone like that it's about the global rebirth of record manufacturing um you know in uh, you know even as, as far as a decade ago um it was a small thing you know right. it, it it was building um and in fact i had pitched brian to do a vinyl specific conference in 2013 when i first caught an inkling that the comeback might be happening something was brewing right? um and so you know much to brian's credit it probably at that point was too much too soon <laughs> uh, but four years later he called me and and said you remember that idea you have we're, we're probably gonna do it this year <laughs> so Right. How do you guys know each other? We've been working um, in, we'll say, one in in a very different relationship over the years. We met um, back um, when Larry was a writer for a publication um, that covered the CD DVD business, and um, at that time, I was uh, working for a company that was actually manufacturing machines that loaded magnetic tape into audio cassettes and video cassettes. Okay. Uh, and then we kind of transitioned into the CD business. And it was also a part of a, an exhibitor led organization that kind of fought back against what was at that time the industry event because they had exuberantly very, exuberantly high costs to exhibit at their events. And they kept on saying all of the time, hey, 
you know, if you don't like it, you know, somebody else will take your space. Um, and if you're not there, people will think there's problems with your company. Right. And they explained to me that, you know, your competition feels that there's not enough events and they're perfectly fine with the uh, prices that they're charging. So, you know, one day I crossed across the aisle and I said to my competition, how do you feel about all this? And we, they said, we're complaining about this all the time. There's, it's too expensive, too many events, and nobody's listening to us. Right. So we, we kind of formed an association and we used, uh, let's say, our methods to create what was called the Media Tech Association. And that's when Larry and I really started working together quite a bit um, because he was following what we were doing. And of course, he was working on some pretty major events at the time, too. Yeah, it was one, one of the great things to cover from a trade journalist's perspective, you know, and to see this um, revolution of sorts, <laughs> you know, it was it was like a, there was like a cliffhanger, you know, were they going to boycott the next event, which they basically did. And um, they created something anew that, you know, that stuck, you know, had a pretty good run. Yeah, yeah for, for a pretty long time. And it's it's ironic how we're now back together again and we've created really the only dedicated event for the vinyl record industry and when you ask the question you know what's the elevator pitch that's basically it if you want to know how records are made how they're um what's the supply chain what's the distribution factor you come to making vinyl because all of those people now come to our event um, and they exchange that information and it was particularly particularly important um, to be able to do that in the beginning because, you know, it was during the time of when it was growing I and mean, particularly during COVID when it was like the Wild West, we were just all trying to keep up just with the demand. Right. Um, now, you know, we're working on so many different things, which include quality, uh, making better records, sustainable records. And, you know, these are all things that we're going to you know, be providing to not only just the industry, but the, to consumers soon. And I'm sure they'll appreciate, we'll say, better sounding records and more sustainable products. Um, and, you know, the idea also that you don't have to wait eight to 12 months to have your records made anymore. You, like Larry mentioned, you can have them now done in, in some cases in six weeks in a reasonable some kind of reasonable amount of time well I think the the your the thrust of your conference is really interesting you know it's somewhere in but it's not like quite an audiophile thing it's not really like a record show it's it, it's a a really interesting segment of you know what's going on and, and as people get into records a little bit more some of us have been into them for a, a very long time but for those of us that are you know just joining now they may be wondering yeah, what's up with those times? Hey, how do we make this stuff? You know, so this this conference seems to me like a a really great uh, meeting of the minds, a really great sounding board where uh, everybody can kind of get together and ask those questions and maybe find some answers and uh, at least think about it. Could you even go back a little bit further? Maybe both of you could just tell me a little bit about, you know, your relationship with uh, media and records, uh, um, just kind of growing up, uh, you know, because you're you're not involved in a conference like this. Uh, I'm sure it's much st still a labor of love. So I'm sure that you both have a, a passion for uh, records and vinyl and maybe you could just both share a little personal uh feeling about that i started buying records when i was about 14 years old i remember the first uh, album i bought was actually um a cutout of introducing the beatles um for you know 99 cents or something like that right and um right after that i bought um hot rocks had just come out um, so it was about 1972 or so, 71, 70, 72. Um, and um, I, then it was like no stopping. I mean, you know, any allowance money would go towards that. How about you, Brian? I know you worked in the, the digital field quite a bit, but what about your connection with uh, vinyl? Well, it's, it's kind of funny for me because I started in the industry of physical media back in 1984. And uh, my plan wasn't really to be in the physical media industry. I wanted to be an airline pilot. Oh. Um, but uh, I, got, <laughs> I got offered this technical position at a company um, in Detroit that was manufacturing um, video cassettes. 
and you know video cassettes were something that everybody had at that time sure. and just by the fact of how we put content onto video cassettes as compared to we'll say what we see now in the digital world is so completely different to how we did things back then it was so manual physical uh, but it was a production process and i think that's why i've kind of stuck in this industry for so many years is because especially now when you look at the vinyl record industry it's it's a craft it's people that are not we'll say doing this as a business because they feel that they're going to make a tremendous amount of money they're doing it because they like the idea of vinyl records they like the idea that they're actually putting their blood sweat and tears into manufacturing them um, and, uh, and I find that interesting. And that's why, too, I collect records because each one has, is like a snowflake. They're all different to each other. Um, but, you know, they are something very special. And it's a great way to support artists um, because in the digital world, there's not that much money that can be made anymore unless you're an artist that's been touring for 15, 20 years, and you can consistently put out new product. It's very complicated or uncommon now uh, to see that happen unless you have a huge social media following. Um, and then at that point, you feel that you can press records or you can make money off of digital media. Uh, so that's why it's, it's exciting to me, because I can see other ways to be able to produce new talent and for them to find ways to survive right. um, in this in this world today. And, you know, it's interesting how, you, you know, we all bring our backgrounds with us as far as vinyl is concerned. And I'm, I'm a musician also in my other uh, world. And I was recently in another one of these interviews talking to a great musician. He's Minneapolis based. His name is uh, Charlie Bruber. And uh, he had not pressed his record to vinyl. And um, he's got a new album. And I said, well, you know, did you hear about this conference? He said, oh, I'm going to write that down because I got to go there. Maybe I can meet someone or talk to someone about how I could go through that process and get it pressed on vinyl. Because, you know, musicians uh, maybe of a certain age are also um, in love with the idea of being on a record, right? What's more romantic? for a musician you know it's one thing to make the music but the next is like oh here's my thing you know here's the here's the thing to be proud of um did you get a lot of that this year do you have a lot of musicians that show up to sort of meet people and sort of say hey how do i go through this process because it's a little daunting right it's different than pressing a uh, a cd you know you can get you can do it all online with a cd all the files are digital and and bang you know you just pay the money and a and a, and a crate of cds shows up but but back to your um it being a little bit of an art form what have you heard from musicians and and do they sort of uh come to the conference well i guess the best example of this is it wasn't so much the musicians because they're on tour right now but metallica bought a pressing plant because right. they wanted to put out their catalog and they wanted to do it quickly and the way they wanted to do it and the best way to do that was to own it <laughs> so, right. so they bought um uh, furnace manufacturing in in uh, virginia um and their i guess business of uh, that they had a few people there actually representing the band um we haven't really had i guess that's like the growth area that maybe brian and i will be working on next is actually figuring out a way to bring bring in musicians as well mm. Uh, we do, but actually, this is a nice segue to our next event. Uh, we partnered with the vinyl, uh, the Harlem Vinyl Festival in the Netherlands, which is outside of Amsterdam. Um, and that, for the first day and a half, we're presenting the B two B side of the story, and then the Harlem Vinyl Festival is is, is having musicians all over town playing you know various concerts but also the they have their own more you know um consumer facing type of thing you know, for the musicians who want to know how to, to do it hopefully we will attract some of them um you know to cover uh, to attend the, the the full making vinyl portion of it as well I see. So you're kind of uh, you're there. There's there's another event that's going on that you can kind of get a little synergy going on. Right. We're co-locating, I guess. Is right. The, 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 yeah, we're there the, the Thursday, Friday, and then their event starts on the Friday afternoon and runs through the weekend. Oh, cool. 
co-locate i like that i'm gonna i'm gonna tell that to my wife and kids i say listen we co-locate together we have to be respectful of each other's uh, boundaries here um so back to the idea that there was this um backlog of vinyl pressings and uh you know the plants were all at max capacity what was the feeling this year um you know things are better as you said you know maybe you've got a couple of weeks that people would wait but um what was sort of the the conversations that you overheard this year about that backlog and and where it's going and has it been alleviated or or is it something that uh, i guess much of it had to do with the uh um, just the pandemic based, uh, you know, chain being all backed up. But what, what were some of the things that you heard this year? Well, I think everyone was pretty much in agreement that it's better. It's healthier for the industry at large to not have to wait 10 months. Right. So it, it, it was basically not the price that the industry paid, but basically that catch up, you know, will sustain and also demonstrate the resiliency that the industry had in in that rough period. Um, I mean, what is fantastic is the consumer demand hasn't really, uh, you know, lessened at all. So, and the l- younger demographic, a, a, a graphic, especially, you know, has fallen in love with the format. Um, seven out of the ten best-selling records last year were millennial or gen z artists you know like they weren't the, you know the uh the baby boomer taste that um, retro stuff right 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 i mean yeah sure you know uh um, fleetwood mac and pink floyd will show up and michael jackson will show up but that's about it you know um then not to say that those records are not selling you know they still you know sell but they're selling in large much larger numbers than i think the major labels had ever anticipated at this stage and what about this uh, sorry brian did you have anything to add to that no um other maybe other than you know we we expected that we would see this catch up um in regards to how many plants that have now as larry mentioned increased their capacity or the number of new plants that have come online since we've started the conference um, when we were doing our initial research and putting the event together, there was only 35 production plants in the world. Um, now um, we can forecast that we'll probably see by the end of 2023, 200 plants that will be online. And um, it was also interesting to hear that even at the Making Vinyl Conference in Minneapolis, there was a lot of people there that were interested in starting a new plant and there was many people there saying we're in the process of opening our new plant Mm. Uh, so the enthusiasm there the enthusiasm is still there to continue to try to grow the market and the 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 key here is to get the younger folks we'll say um more and more engaged in in what we're all doing and um, i think a lot of that will happen by, as Larry also pointed out, they uh, will say more millennial driven artists are producing quite a bit of content in physical form now. Right. Yeah, the other thing, if we go back to 2017, when we launched Making Vinyl, uh, we gathered up about seven of the existing plants that had been producing records for quite some time um, to speak, and then we, also gathered about six or seven um newer plants that started operations in the in the in the previous five years including uh third man pressing in detroit which was fairly new i mean they opened it in february we had the event in november um what we didn't realize was in the audience there were at least a dozen people on the verge of you know opening doing this right and and in fact, when we did it in 2018, and since this is the Vinyl District's um, uh, podcast, uh, John Myers of Vinyl District was very uh, proactive in actually reaching out to Brian, um, you know, becoming like a, like a media uh, sponsor of, of the event. Um, so b- every year, more people would, you know, kick the tires you know is this something we should get into and right. sure enough they did 
Right. So, well, that's good. And those people are in the industry now and uh, it keeps it fresh. And it also uh, keeps everyone from blaming Adele for the slow production. Poor Adele got so much flack, right? She, uh, They said she uh, made a, c- a kajillion records and uh, bogged up all of the, the, the manufacturers. Which, which actually was, you know, an example of the mass media not really understanding the nuances of the industry. Right. Um, it was... A, you know, at that point, we had a capacity of probably when that record came out, probably 130, 140 million records. And OK, she had two records, I guess, because uh, across that album. Right. So they pressed supposedly 500,000. So even if you like put two records in the album, that's a million. But there's 130 million. Right. Uh, if it, it might have affected Sony's relationships with pressing plans that Adele took priority right. and other artists might have had a way. But it, it was an example. And actually, I don't want to take full credit of this. Billy Fields from Warner Music was the first who I heard actually put that into the proper perspective. And he was absolutely right about it. And Billy, Billy's been involved with us since 2017, you know, as a speaker. Right. Good. I hope that gets everybody off Adele's back. <laughs> She's doing okay. She's doing all right. Um, uh, you know, interesting. I guess one of the other things that comes up at the uh, conference is shipping. And for a lot of us who, you know, maybe aren't within a uh, reasonable distance of a record store, a lot of people, of course, order things online, uh, wherever you order them from. And in fact, I noticed it, it's funny. I had a gift certificate to a large bookstore chain. I won't say who it was. I guess I could say it doesn't really matter. But I went to uh, use the gift certificate the other day and what had been a huge vinyl department a huge vinyl area was now whittled down to just this so people are you know still going to be of course ordering things online nothing is more uh upsetting when you get something in the mail and it's completely trashed it's in it's in terrible disrepair um and conversely i've also gotten some boxes that have looked like they've been through a war and the contents inside are surprisingly fine but what do you what's coming down the pike as far as shipping or uh you know damage woes uh with manufacturers things like that what what can people expect to see um, you know, maybe being improved or different ways to approach getting the actual product in your hand? Well, I can tell you one thing. Every record that comes out of a plant is is perfect. It's, it's only when it gets in the hands of the shipping people, right. that's where the problems occur. We can, we can write on the boxes, do not stack. These are fragile. These are vinyl records on the inside. And it's just completely out of your control at that point once those records are picked up. Um, and then, yeah, you can say, too, when you're shopping online, you know, for those that are pulling those off the racks and then putting them into the boxes, they don't have maybe the particular experience all of the time that maybe it needs to be in a thicker box. Maybe it needs to have some padding on the inside of it uh, to ensure that it doesn't get damaged upon delivery. But the, the best way to eliminate that is to support your independent record stores. Go to the stores. They'll have perfect ones there. They're going to make sure that you're taken care of and you don't have to worry about damaged records at that point. Right. Larry, any uh, any uh, packaging input there? I um, am on the uh, Vinyl Me Please um, list and... and um, their pack their records are very very well packaged and you know a, a company like that you know uses the packaging as a branding um exercise right it says a whole bunch of stuff on that you right, do right. this is and, cool music inside and and, and right. interesting so, yeah you know like so where i live and you know where they they most of the time they bring it to my door but sometimes i find it down at, at, over where the mailboxes are you know, and I'm thinking, well, maybe my neighbors are thinking, well, what is randomly police? <laughs> right. Know? Right. Uh, you know, and also I think it, it's an opportunity for um, companies in record production to walk the talk in terms of sustainability. I mean, they could use, um, you know, um, uh, recyclable paper and things like that. Right. Uh, you know, um, we, one of the... Uh, experts that we had at the Minneapolis event was um, 
uh, a lawyer who was, uh, you know, explaining how you can't just say you're green and not actually follow through on it. Right. Um, so they, they they call that greenwashing. <laughs> you know. Um, so I mean, I think that carries over to the packaging as well. Right. Well, it's interesting, and I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the sustainability. Also, um, uh, I. I am okay. I'm okay with my vinyl here. So I'm comfortable with, uh, you know, uh, buying new records. And uh, I think it's pretty sustainable to buy used records. And I wanted to ask you about some of those numbers, too. But um, what what have you heard um, about sustainability in the industry? I mean, what do you how could you I guess there's people thinking about different ways, different vinyl formulations that are a little more friendly to the environment. But as you've as I'm sure you guys have read as well, um, streaming isn't without its, uh, you know, it isn't without its environmental concerns either. You know, you've got to have um, a lot of hard drives and uh, cloud computing uh, is also takes makes an impact on the environment. So, you know, who knows really what's what's the better thing. But what are some advancements that you've heard about in um, thinking about sustainability in the vinyl record industry? Well, one of the things that we're seeing right now is the trend to move away from PVC that has particular metals that are used to stabilize the material. Um, <clears throat> lead is one of those items that a lot of plants are really trying to stay away from. You, you know, when we think of lead, it's only a very small amount of lead. It's not like anything that you would be concerned about holding the record. Um, but we're now looking to go into other type of different stabilized materials that doesn't require the use of lead or tin um, or other types of metals, as I mentioned. One of the um, trends right now or one of the areas that is being developed is materials that is used or made from um, sugarcane. Mm. So you, you can almost say you can eat the record if you wanted to, and there wouldn't be any adverse effects, but there's still going to be plastic in it. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're getting closer and closer to making those records sound good or great. Um, they sound a little bit loud right now. You know, um, the sound, you know, they have a little bit more surface noise on them, but uh, eventually we'll figure out ways to tweak that out. And I guess also it depends on the material or the, the content that you have on the record too. If you got something that's got a lot of bass in it, you're not going to hear it. But if it's got soft points in the music, they'll probably hear it. They'll come across as a scratch or, or crackle. Um, but we'll, we'll be able to tweak all of that out in, in the very near future. Interesting. Interesting. Larry, have you heard anything uh, on your end about well, that? Well, it's interesting that, you know, it's possible to make records out of everything from coffee, paper, right, um, soap. I've seen demonstrations of all these things, and they play music. <laughs> so, what they sound like is a different story, but right, yes, they, right. they, they, they but, will function that way. Yeah, but it's interesting that we're going to um, Holland where they're very serious about sustainable um, record produ production. Um, and a lot of the experiments and tests that are happening there. At the Minneapolis event, um, one of our British speakers, uh, Karen Emanuel from Key Production, had said, you know, the industry is always characterized Europe as being 10 years, not 10 years, three, three years behind uh, the US. But I have to say, in terms of sustainability, I think Europe is 10 years ahead of the US. Mm. And she might be right about that, you know. Um, could be yeah interesting well we'll we'll wait and see and then the debates can begin with uh uh the audio files and everybody in the say oh i want those uh vi i want that lead-based vinyl back those those sounded better or 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 vice versa who knows maybe somebody will prefer something else but you also remind me of when we were kids you know you'd go to mcdonald's and get some cardboard thing that came in your happy meal and it had a record on it or something it didn't sound very good but it was it was an awful lot of fun who's really ahead of the curve i mean maybe you don't want to single a pressing plant out or but what else do you see or i know we're talking about sustainability but what about just technology um and brian i i guess that was really sort of the world that you lived in um uh, you know it, digitally but but who's really what are some plants that are really on the cutting edge who's really pressing 
pressing and manufacturing stuff that's just like whoa they're they're taking it to an, the next level uh well there's there's so many to list i would probably not want to list just a few and not being able to list all right of them. right i understand but what, what, what what we're seeing right now is new equipment coming online which uses new technology within itself when the the vinyl demand started to increase back in 2013 2014 there wasn't many machines that were still available because most of the machines we'll say in the 90s were was discarded or destroyed right um so when we were looking for we'll say more ways to make more records we had to figure out where any machine would be available and i even heard of a story that one of the um, production facilities um, decommissioned one of their machines and they uh, donated that machine to like a, a town museum to kind of show that at one time they were pressing records. Right. Um, and not too long ago, they had to go back to that museum and ask for the machine back. Yeah, we need you that know, thing we back. Need it again. We need it again. Right. Uh, but we're very lucky. We have, we'll say, four companies, five companies now that are making the record presses. Um, and that's a good thing because they're making them in a way that um, is new technology, new materials, and they're, they're manufacturing more consistent records because of that now. Right. Larry, any technological uh, stuff that you've heard about, you know, that's really blown your mind? Well, what's blown my mind is there's only one supplier globally of lacquers, mm. which you know it, unless you're doing direct metal mastering you you absolutely need a lacquer first to you know get the molds made and and right so um and that somehow this company in japan after uh well i mean they were already producing large volumes but the uh u.s supplier of lacquers in in california apollo um had a fire that devastated the operation and they didn't even talk about rebuilding um and somehow this japanese firm has really stepped it up to supply the world i mean which is i think of an example of the resilience you know you have the double whammy of the the pandemic causing shortages in terms of raw materials and also supply chain bottlenecks and and then you, you lose like a major supplier of this thing you really really need um and the prices did go up for a while but i think they have stabilized a bit um and i think anyone entering the industry you know needs to take that into account that's what they're getting into eyes wide open um you know to do their due diligence right so if you're thinking of opening a record pressing plant maybe you should consider the lacquer side of things that would be fantastic. It, it would be it would be helpful. You know, when we had, uh, as Larry mentioned, two suppliers of lacquers, one in Japan, one here in the United States, we said, why isn't there more than two? There should be three. There should be four. Mm. I think we need to have more than one. Um, I think that would make, we'll say, everybody feel a little bit more comfortable, but not everybody likes to talk about it. It's like one of those things, ah, okay. <laughs> why do you think that is, Brian? Why do you think that uh, is? I, I don't know. I don't understand it sometimes why we're not trying to find another solution um, to finding another way to have more than one lacquer manufacturer. Uh, it's not that you're going to make a tremendous amount of money manufacturing lacquers, but I think from the perspective of that we're building such an industry and we're trying to get so many people um, involved in the industry, and if we lose one key component, I think I, those people would be very upset with us for not explaining that there was only one supplier. Right. And that's why I think that there should be more than one. Um, but for some reason or another, there have been some attempts and there have been failed attempts to you know, be able to provide um, another source of lacquers. And hopefully whoever might be listening to this right now might be working on something new and 
they'll be able to announce it at a making model conference soon we've got some young lacquer uh suppliers tuned in i hope i i certainly hope so uh it's interesting you know as you guys talk about this too i, I obviously i've been collecting records uh for many many years far well before the resurgence and a lot of these records behind me were uh, on my shelves before the year 2000 or in the late 90s and every once in a while something would be pressed and it would just mystify me you know and i'd say like who's even doing this like how where how are they gonna do you know and i of course i love records and i was uh, always champion championing championing um records to be produced but it always was in the back of my mind like who's Who's going to actually do that? There are pressing plants. There are going to be enough machines. That, so it's amazing now, really, to think about. I mean, the, the whole resurgence has been amazing to witness in my lifetime. But it, what's really amazing is the back end stuff. And again, back to your conference, what makes your conference unique and interesting is the back end stuff that's going on. That's really the nitty gritty um, manufacturing of this stuff because they're just making these things from scratch again. The, the not the records. I mean. The, the actual machines that press the records. Yeah, it's it's it definitely takes an army to be able to provide what um, enough rac uh, records um, to supply what the demand has been, <clears throat> and it's it's just been really great to be able, as I mentioned before, to support so many people. Um, when we look back at those numbers out of what I mentioned, when there was like thirty five plants when we started the conference, and now you know, we'll be close to 200 soon, we can safely say more than half of those new plants wouldn't have started if they didn't come to a making vinyl conference. Right, right. Yeah, but, and, and the reason for that is it, the networking opportunities allow them to meet their next suppliers or make deals uh, next, they, they meet their customers there as well. And we touched on this just a little earlier, um, but uh, new records versus used records. Uh, when those stats come out about new vinyl releases, and uh, you know things are there are uh, there the the numbers are so much higher than they were. Used records aren't mentioned. You know it's probably impossible to track that metric. But what's been the feedback that you've received about you know used vinyl? It might even trump the numbers that new vinyl proclaims you know the 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 numbers of people buying records might be much much higher uh if you wager in the used uh, market well i remember when we were about to do the 2018 event and deloitte had put out a study that said it was a billion dollar business and i think at that stage they weren't even factoring in the used market because as you said, it's impossible to track. Right. Um, but we hear from Discogs, which is probably the biggest clearinghouse for for the sale of used records, um, that half of their sales these days are new, newly pressed records. So there's a nice balance, you know, and and shows, you know, from a music fan's perspective. You know, sometimes they want the uh, OG type of, you know, right. pressing. And then otherwise, you know, it's not bad to have um, something brand new. It depends. Everything is relative. You know, uh, it, it, it amazes me, me how in the late 60s, Los Angeles alone had like a dozen pressing plants. And, you know, some of them probably made very good records and some of them didn't. And now I could, I'll put on a Stax record from uh, like um, Booker T and the MGs, and it, I'm amazed, even though it looks beat up, it sounds better than sometimes a newly pressed record. Right. It depends on what you, you know, and also what you're listening it on and, and so forth. I mean, I've never um, considered myself uh, um, an audiophile, mainly because I never had the disposable income to get into that world. Right. So I'd sooner buy more records, <laughs> you know. Right. And as Brian was saying, it depends also on the style of music you're listening to. If you're listening to something that's very quiet, uh, you know, uh, I guess a lot of and, and the classical industry seems to be getting into vinyl. Also, I know uh, there were a couple of reports just in the last week or two uh, with a few labels who are really uh, putting out more 
uh, classical music on vinyl, which, you know, is, uh, I, I think there was a segment of the listening public, especially, you know, CDs, when CDs came out, the classical people were really like, oh, you know, because now we can really hear this with, uh, you, you know, complete silence in the background now of course there are trade-offs with that as well but um but a good old rock and roll record you're right it could be a little banged up and it's from uh 1973 but you throw it on the turntable and it sounds pretty good because it's just it's a loud uh powerful uh performance on those grooves i remember you know when i was first exposed to vinyl it was through my dad and because my dad had his own collection of vinyl of course i was never able or allowed to touch it right um, but, you know, he doesn't play his records anymore. And one of the last times that I was uh, visiting him, you know, all of his records are down in the basement. And when you just go down there and you start just uncovering all of the treasures of what he was listening to. And I, I played a couple of them on his very archaic uh, turntable and it just sounded fantastic. You can't beat that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's become so cliche to talk about the sound of records and, uh, and everything that goes along with it. But, uh, at the same time, I mean, the reason that we're here talking about this, the reason that we've, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all doing things in the vinyl industry because it's real, it's, it's true. And, you know, you just can't get, uh, it might be difficult to put your finger on what it is, but you can't really get that experience. Uh, digitally, you can come pretty darn close, but it's it's not the same thing, right? Definitely, and it's we went through a period too with everything being digital that everything's mastered to be very loud, right? Um, so you really don't, even though that it has the tremendous um, uh, way of being able to sample the music in forty four thousand bytes, you know, per second. Um, it's all very compressed loud music and that's what's really cool when you get back into the vinyl is that it's uncompressed in some respects and you can really sense the difference between let's say a quiet part as you mentioned and a loud part you you can really feel the difference in the music right absolutely larry anything to add there yeah i mean in terms of um sound you you do hear the warmth i mean um a lot of times you know, depending on the mood or what I'm working on, I will. If I'm if I'm very busy, admittedly, I'll listen to stuff through Spotify through my smart TV, right? But listen, don't feel but, bad about it, Larry. You know? No, 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 no. And I think Spotify is <laughs> a fantastic. We all do. We all music do. Discovery. Sure. And if I really like an album that I didn't know about. It could be new or it could be even old back catalog. Right. Uh, And I really love it. I was like, I have to have this on vinyl. You know, I mean, it happens often. Um, But when I have the time to really sit down and listen. So, for example, lately, I don't know, for some reason, I've been listening to more Pink Floyd. So I had bought the live Dark Side of the Moon that came out a couple months ago. But I only listened to it once. And I think after we're done here, I'm going to put that on. And the one time I listened to it, it was really depressing. I mean, I was very pleased with the sound of it. Good. That's good. Yeah. And it it delivered exactly what I was looking for, not the note by note studio version, you know, although it was called live. I mean, it was slightly different. Well, cool. Listen, I and I'll just wrap up by asking um, really more for Larry, but Brian, of course, you can chime in as well. But you just wanted to touch on Record Store Day. It was a nice Record Store Day this year. I wanted to just share some of the things that I got uh, on my Record Store Day. The Happy Dragon Band. This is a reissue from ORG Music, uh, a 1978 album that uh, I guess is pretty tough to find. It's really an interesting record, so I was glad I got that. Uh, Also from ORG, they do these um, Sun Records compilations this is their 10th one and this is about love you'd think this might have come out in february but it came out just a few weeks ago and i was very lucky to find the paul mccartney um red rose speedway half uh, speed half speed remastered so i was excited to get that and of course my 
Pièce de Résistance was the Scott Weiland 12 Bar Blues. This is a, an album that, uh, for for someone of my age, uh, meant a lot in 1998 and late 90s. So, and it wasn't on vinyl until just this year. And I'm I'm always a real sucker for that marketing angle. This has never been on vinyl before. It was only on CD in the 90s, and now is the only time that you can get it on vinyl. So, I'm happy that I found found this but what was your feedback what did you hear about record store day um this year larry i think people were pretty pleased with the list um and the great thing about it is i didn't even know some of those titles that you just mentioned were on the list i you know i i just like zero in on the artists that i'm interested in in in, in getting right so you mentioned org, org music i actually write liner notes for for them occasionally oh okay so, okay so cool I did, um I think it was on Black Friday, the um, Skip James uh, album. That yes, was. I have that. I have that. It's great. It's a really cool record. And um, earlier I did uh, Detective um, as well as um, um, a, Bill, a Big Bill Brunzi. Um, so, I mean, that was a big thrill for me, actually, to you know see my name on, a, on an album. I had done one or two CDs you know it, it, you know uh in the 2000s but but um you know i felt like i arrived <laughs> now well, it's, it it's like we were talking about musicians before you know there's nothing uh and for a writer as well i mean liner notes are the coolest thing to to write and when a musician creates a great album or a great work of music it's um uh, you know, it's very exciting that it's on a record. There's just something intangible about that that connection there. But what's the news with Record Store Day? I know you've always got your finger on the Record Store Day pulse. Uh, what's, you know, how has it been? It's been, how? when was the first one now? How long has it been happening? 10 years? No, longer than that. This longer. was the 16th, 16th year. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, 2007 was the first year. Um, you know, I... When I, I researched the book, I thought it was all about the limited edition records. And when I realized it was really about the culture of record stores. And I realized that was missing from my own life. And I think that's one of the reasons why I jumped at the chance to, to develop this franchise with Brian. Um, because it brought me closer to to the record stores. And in fact, the funny thing is I mentioned when I was a teenager and I bought my first record, I tried so hard to get a, a, a job working at a record store, and I could never get one. So then, um, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine had a record store, and he needed you know, someone to spell him at, you know, he's a one-man shop. So I said, sure, you know, and about once a month, I would like go in. And he says, I can't pay you, but I'll, I'll pay you in records. I mean, the other that ironic works. thing is, in 2000, 10 i sold most of my collection and then about a year or two later i realized what a colossal mistake i did and i spent the last 10 years like rebuilding it um, to its former glory you know right. and i'm running out of space in my uh, very cramped manhattan apartment um so i mean uh, getting back to records to a day i mean they're, they're constantly moving into different areas um now they have a program called uh record store day essentials which is almost like a year-round type of program like they're making suggestions to independent record stores what they should have on stock at all times right uh, which i think is a great you know that's a that's a great thing um and i mean when when i was starting the book I wanted to find out why are people waiting online, <laughs> you know, right. uh, sometimes camped out the night before. I mean, you know, I think, you know, and the anxiety, if you won't be able to get what you, you what you're there for, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's what I found very intriguing as well. Yeah. yeah. I'm not that guy. I'm not the camp out kind of guy, but I do, 
you know, I mean, I appreciate the, listen, it's a, it's a day uh, that the news is talking about record stores and records and there are interesting um, things on the shelves and what's, what's not to like, you know, it's easy to get grumpy about things. I know some people get grumpy and people get grumpy about everything. Right. But um, you know, it is, it's a day where, you know, you get to kind of focus on records and there's an event and people are excited about it. And, and I, I think, Hey, you know, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And the pandemic actually helped them change the way they were doing business. A lot of these independent stores didn't have websites, but right. they very learned how to sell stuff online. And they also, uh, Record Store Day relaxed the rules that they couldn't sell online. So if you couldn't, which was certainly understandable, you didn't want to catch COVID. So, right. um, so if you weren't able to get to the store or whatever, the next day, they still had the stock over it they could sell it right i my my theory my uh, my secret is uh go late go late in the day or go first thing the next day and see what's left over usually i've been very successful that way i don't i don't think you have to be the first one in line you can line up if you want to but that's my that's my uh record store day secret to success go go when the crowds thin out and then you have full reign of whatever's remaining there you may not get your first pick but you might you might be surprised so remember that you guys if you if you if you're online so maybe we could just wrap up with you know what was your what were both of your takeaways uh the big thing that stuck with you at the end of the conference this year uh what were what was something that resonated with you as the uh as the uh folding chairs were being folded up and you were uh getting ready to catch your flight out of minneapolis what were what was what was sort of the the idea ringing in your mind as you were wrapping up this year i um thought about prince a lot um you know it was no accident that we held it on June seventh, which would have been Prince's sixty fifth birthday. Okay. And I kept on thinking he would have loved this. And I wouldn't have been surprised if he showed up. And in fact the day after the conference, I went to Electric Fetus, his record favorite record store. That's right. I saw they had some event uh, uh at at the facility there. Right. Well and, and actually um the hometown sponsor of making vinyl in Minneapolis was um, Copycats, which is a new pressing plant. Um, and Brian was very close with uh, the company there. And we uh, had um, tours arranged, the you know, buses taking attendees to see what the, the, the plant was all about. Oh, very cool. All right. How about you, How about you Brian? What was the, uh, what was the big takeaway for you? Uh, the big takeaway for me <clears throat> was to really see the sense of community, um, in particularly between all of these different pressing plants. Um, I'm also involved in was a when the industry organization, which is called the Vinyl um, Record Manufacturing Association. And to see people to come together and share experiences and to really have the passion to drive the industry forward makes me want to continue to drive the industry forward and work with not only those that are in the VRMA, but also, you know, really love the passion of manufacturing vinyl. And lacquers. Don't forget lacquers. And yes, please, somebody make a lacquer for us. <laughs> Well, Brian, Larry, I thank you so much for your time today, and thanks for the hard work that you're doing to, um, you know, just infuse some excitement and conversation into the vinyl industry. We love our records, and uh, we need folks like you that are uh, being champions of records, and uh, let's keep it going, and I'll, I'll see you in Amsterdam. Well, I didn't get my plane ticket, but uh, that would be fun. I, I guess that's the next thing, so have a great conference in Amsterdam, and uh, any, any whispers about what the next stop in the states will be next year not yet not can, yet and can't can, can, no, let people know that yet but it's coming we'll be able to announce that soon all right all right well again thanks to you both thanks for your time i really appreciate it thank you my pleasure all thank right. you i uh, i have to go my uh, my co-locators are uh, have come home so i have to <laughs> i have to co-locate with them right now and figure out what dinner it is